Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Hanging on to Hope podcast. I'm Brenda J. And I'm Karen Wonder. And we are hangingontohope.org. This podcast is intended as educational and is not psychological or medical advice. Always consult a professional when needed, and we disclaim any liability in connection with the instruction, information, or advice given. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Hanging on to Hope podcast. This is Brenda J. Today, we have David Rubelet on the show. I thought I would take the introduction because I was pretty sure Karen wouldn't be able to pronounce the name. <laughs> so, <laughs> David, <laughs> David is a trauma and for theologian, pastor, worship leader, spiritual abuse survivor, advocate, speaker, and co-host of Evolution of Faith podcast. David helps in faith renewal and religious trauma-informed recovery, and his expertise extends to guiding victims towards healing. So welcome to the show, David. Thank you so much. I've been excited about this. Yes, we're excited. Yeah, we are. Definitely. So this is Karen. It's nice to officially meet you. Yeah. So you've said that trauma affects mental health. Regarding mental health and Christianity, struggling with anxiety and depression, it's talked about very little because it makes us look like a bad Christian. We haven't talked much about anxiety and depression from a Christian standpoint. Anything you want to add as to what created this false belief? Well, I think a misuse of scripture is a huge one. <laughs> and I can, yeah, I can pick apart context. some of that. Yeah, there's a huge misuse of scripture there. I think that there is a disconnect with mental health as it also pertains to any other form of health. Because mental health, especially when it's attached to trauma, I, I can't speak for some of the other things that I'm less educated in, is a nervous system struggle. And so if we understand that, when somebody comes to me and says, hey, I'm having a knee replacement this next week, would you pray for me, Pastor? Absolutely. So what I'm going to pray for, I'm going to pray for wisdom of the doctors with his knee. I will pray for a miracle that he's up and going quicker than they expected. However, I entrust that my role as a pastor is to understand that I'm not going to be in the operating room operating on his leg. I think that the same thing when it comes to mental health is we need to put the same thing in the same category and say, hey, pastor, I'm, I'm struggling with anxiety. Would you pray for me? Yeah, absolutely. God, I pray for the professionals and the counselors and which are seen, which by the way, we have ones that we partner with so that we're not taking that on ourselves. God, I pray that you bring about wisdom to them. I pray that you know how to help them through. It's a nervous system situation. And God, I do pray for a miracle. I pray that there's healing that happens in ways where hoops are jumped through in ways that are miraculous. Yeah, God. But in order for us to get there, we have to let go of the idea that everything is about a cognitive belief. Because with mental health, it's more than that. It's way more than that. And I think that every verse that we misuse is like, oh, you just need to believe more. Like, the joy of the Lord's my strength. It's like, well, yeah. But that doesn't mean that the pain that I need strength through is going to go away as I walk through it, you know? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. You have a post that says, in anxiety, Jesus sweat drops of blood as he prayed in the garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane. Luke twenty two forty four says, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling on the ground. You say the word anguish in Greek is yep. agonia, which literally means anxiety. Jesus understands and empathizes with our moments of anxiety and despair. This is very comforting for all of us. Can you expound on that? Yeah, I think that what we see is he knows that he's about ready to suffer like the ultimate level of trauma. I mean, it's the most brutal form of capital punishment by state execution ever in the history of mankind, which I believe is part of the reason why scripture says that he came in the fullness of time. It was one of the things where he unfortunately 
was knew that he was going to step into that type of death. And as he did that, he's like, God, if there's a way, let this cup pass from me. Mm-hmm. And in that moment, there's so much anguish in his body. I mean, I, I've thrown up before and I've cried hard where both of those, my face turns red because of the capillaries. And this moment, it was in so much anxiety that he sweat drops of blood, which tells me, and here's where I would go with it. And I, I've said this in sermon clips. I've posted this in text online is that this tells me to all who think anxiety is a sin, that the sinless son of God, God himself in human form, experienced anxiety. Therefore, it is not a sin. Oh, it good. is a natural it is a natural form of what our body does when either we think we're going to go through something or we have gone through something. Yeah. So, yeah. That's so good because everybody always thinks it's we have something wrong with us when we have anxiety. It's exactly how God has wired us to function. Mm. Yep. Yeah, just that agonizing of what he went through. So Jesus talks about worry in Matthew 6, and at that chapter... He says, but seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness, and all these things will be given unto you as well. Matthew 6.33, you say Jesus redirected his focus from objects of worry to objects of the kingdom. The word righteousness is the same word we get justice from. This means to deal with what has systematically or relationally fractured peace and right relationship. Did you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, there's quite a bit here. I mean, Jesus, we just talked about him sweating drops of blood. It's that agony and anxiety before he is about ready to do the ultimate work of justice and righteousness, which isn't always fun. Right. (laughs) But here's the piece about justice. And this is I actually got from Sanghoon, who I know you guys have had on the show is that ultimately justice work, when we step in to either speak on our behalf or on the behalf of other people, we're actually seeking to break generational trauma and generational and continual patterns. And so there's a part of us that when we see justice, when I'm like, I, I, I'm anxious, I'm anxious, I'm anxious, and I'm like, you know what, I, I, I'm, going, I'm going to heal and then I am, I'm going to have a voice. And when I have my voice to speak, I'm going to break the power that is holding me down and that potentially is holding others down that will have a ripple effect for generations. And I think that Jesus, when he's calling us to focus on that righteousness, it's knowing that there's a piece of that that's going to break the things that make us anxious. And there's a whole lot more there. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I would rather turn my focus towards the things of righteousness and justice and seek it for myself and others than dwell on the things that hold me down. Yeah. That's why this last season I mentioned I spoke out for my friend. I got pretty beaten up for it. But I know that I have healed to where I know that I have a voice, I know I have agency, and therefore I'm seeking to break the holds of that stuff. One awesome metaphor, and I hope I answered your question. There's a lot here because if you understand intergenerational trauma, there's a whole other piece there as well of how it plays out in generations after yourself. And so if I seek justice for what has brought harm to me and what might bring harm to others, I'm also breaking genetically what I might pass down to my kids. That's Mm -hmm. good. See, this verse for me gets rid of anxiety and worry because I'm seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. And he's saying all these things will be given unto you. It's almost like, don't worry about your life. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I'm going to provide for you. Just like, you know, all those scriptures. It kind of does that for me when I seek him first, and I usually try to do this in the day. It puts everything in line and helps me to have that faith and trust that I need to get through the day and not worry. So I do think it does help with the just basic anxiety Mm -hmm. and and worry during your day as well. Yeah, I I I, what I love. One of the translations says everything else will fall into place. Mm -hmm. It's like seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and everything else will fall into place. Yeah. Um, I love the way that I wait. I love the way that's worded. I think, yeah, without over speaking, I mean, I have a buddy who's a, he's a motorcycle enthusiast and he tells me, he's like, if I'm 
driving down the road and I see a potential hazard, if I focus on avoiding the potential hazard, I'll hit it. And he's like, <laughs> but, but if I turn and I look towards another point that I need to drive to, like maybe an off ramp or something, he said, I focus on that and I wind up avoiding the potential hazard. Mm. And I think that that redirection of focus into the things of God and what, what is right with him. And for me, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, I have yeah. a huge sense of justice. So there's a part of me that that translation of righteousness plays into it because because mm-hmm. I will fight for what's right in my life and the lives of others. And I'd rather put my energy in that if I can. So because it changes people, it changes their situations and it has a ripple effect for the things yeah. of God in their lives. So, yeah. And it gets discouraging if you see, I don't know, to, to me being in the advocacy world, I feel like I hear about all the abuse going on and sometimes all that just feels so heavy. That's yeah. why I, that one podcast I was telling you about, like that just knowing that God sees all these things, nobody's really getting away with anything. You know, that's what this verse is saying too, is that God is, God sees those things, but it's, it is hard as an advocate to not get worn down because you just hear about so many abuses in the church, you know, yeah. but I like that there are more podcasts and like even hearing this podcast that she's writing a book for pastors specifically saying, this is what you need to know. And just even what Lorianne was saying, the one that, that was abused by Rabbi Zacharias and for her to speak up against such a prominent person. I mean, I remember when I first heard it, cause I used to listen to him. I wasn't a huge fan of his, but you know, I think a lot of people had heard of him. And so to speak up against someone that was such a cost to her and they yeah. actually read she wrote a, a part for the chapter that's in this book. And when you just have to hear it because it's so, it's just so powerful, the effect that that had on her, the cost, it was, it was a cost to her yeah. that she had to speak up. But if she hadn't spoken up, you know, that, that was a ripple effect that happened after she spoke up, more people spoke up, yeah. but there was a cost, you know, that what she had to go through. And you really hear that on the podcast when they interview her, but you know. Yeah. And I think it's the same for what we're doing in the abuse world is, more people speaking up, more people are speaking out. These groups have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, and people are seeking healing. Yeah. And they're not repeating past pattern, the same yeah. patterns. There's good things that are happening. Yeah, with, there's with really good things. things. Exposed to, a lot yeah. more people have stepped up. Like, I think I was on a pod. We were doing a podcast, and someone said, Brenda, you didn't have any help 22 years ago. There was nothing out there for you to do. What were you going to do? Now there's so much help for people. Yeah. Is, and it means, I mean, there could be a lot more, but there was none when I was when I needed to get out. So Mm, this is really great. So anyway, on to the next one. What is spiritual bypassing and how does Psalm 23 and Genesis 1 provide an example of finding God's presence in the midst of chaos? Yeah. Well, let's go to the, the Genesis 1 portion. Genesis 1 when God created, it says that, you know, he created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. That word translates out of the Hebrew as chaos. Tohu babohu is what that is. And it literally means formless. It, another way to say it is the wild wasteland. And so you could see that as kind of like soup of all these <laughs> things that aren't created yet, but all the matter that's needed for it hasn't been ordered. But you could also see it with the Wild and Wasteland piece. It's kind of like the drive between Phoenix and LA, where there's like <laughs> just nothing there. You know? But what it says okay. is that these waters, and the waters are kind of like, it actually translates like gross or like sewage water. It's like, it's just like this not good thing yet. <laughs> And it says that the Spirit of God hovered over the surface. And so it's really important when we see everything we're going through is that the Spirit of God has not removed himself from chaos. And uh, it's even to the point where in like Revelation 21, where you see the new heavens and new earth, the old uh, order of things has passed away, and it says, and there is no longer any sea. Which means that there will come a time where the chaos and the brokenness, and right after it says he wipes away every tear, there's no more Mm -hmm. crying or pain. But we see that same God who at the ultimate moment of chaos, of lack of order and a lack of shape of creation, he's hovering over it. And so that tells me that in the everything that I'm going through and wrestling with and the pain that I'm struggling with, that God isn't distant from it, that he's with it. And his goal is to order and reorder things into a place where one day we can hold on to the hope that one day there's no longer any sea, no longer any chaos, mm-hmm. no longer anything that has no purpose that hurts and brings about mourning and crying and pain. So I love that 
that one, that tie there with Genesis 1, because God created, but he's also recreating. So the things in our life that have happened to us or that have caused all kinds of pain, that's not the end of our story. And it's not the end of God's story in that. Mm. And so the and the Spirit of God is the one who's doing the work in us to bring yeah. about renewal and stuff. And it's the same power that raised Christ from the dead. It's the same spirit that when we in our pain don't know what to pray, he intercedes for us according to the will of God who knows exactly what we need and what he's doing as he works all things to that place of no see. So I, I love that image. Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are there. Um, mm-hmm. I also love Psalm 139. If I ascend mm-hmm. into the depths, the greatest depths, of the earth or of the pain. King James says hell. That's not actually what it means. It's to the place of the dead, to the lowest place I can be. If I descend there, you are there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's like, we don't picture that. We think that God is only found in the happy moments. So mm-hmm. be happy. Yeah. And, and that's not how that works. And so we can think and we can overemphasize the happiness of spirituality. We also have really bad ideas about humanity that, uh, and I've mentioned this before, I mentioned this earlier in kind of the earlier section where scripture says God is spirit, where the spirit of the Lord is there's freedom, but it also says he took on flesh and blood and dwelt among us, which means that we also have a spiritual side to us, but we also have a physical side. But oftentimes we tend to overemphasize like, oh, But when we get to heaven, things will be perfect. (laughs) And so we overplay the spiritual side to forget that God cares about the physical. And God cares about what our nervous system is doing. And he wired that to happen in that way. And he wants us to find him in that. Mm. So whatever we're going through, he will Mm -hmm. be there. That's good. It's almost like Psalm 23 was written for anxiety. Like, okay, now calm down and now meditate on this. And then the next thing you know, that. You feeling a lot better. I love Psalm twenty three. Absolutely, I just love that picture of the the chaos too. I like how you said that. How because I know in my brain sometimes things just feel chaotic, you know. Yeah. And just to think about God is the opposite of chaos. He's the one that puts things in order, and that's where we can breathe and let Him lead us, and yeah. you don't have to stay in that chaotic feeling because that's no it, fun. So it's it's such a beautiful use of the word. Like right away, I mean, those are the first two verses of our Bible. Yeah, it's like. God created, and it was wild and wasteland. It was it was chaos, but his spirit hovered over it. So that's the first chapter of the Bible. The last mm-hmm. chapter of our Bible says, and there's no longer any sea. There's no longer any chaos. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, I love that the story of God is just like sandwiched in there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the yeah. whole thing, I don't know, I've been listening to the Bible Project. They have a whole thing on the chaos monster. And oh yeah, I just started listening to that, and it's so interesting. I've only gotten, yeah. I've only listened to the first two, but yeah, the whole thing about the, you know, Leviathan and there's chaos in that that's talked about in the book of Job even. So very interesting. If you're looking for a good book, if I could plug KJ Ramsey has some books, one of them I got on my shelf over here. I have one of her books I haven't read. (laughs) I could pull, but yeah, she walks through Psalm 23 from the perspective of spiritual abuse. Yeah, I did Mm -hmm. it. And I did a Bible study on Psalm 23 too. And it's so, and and I already had had it memorized, but it, I don't know. There's something Peaceful. Peaceful. It, this is so good to bring this up when we're talking about anxiety and, mm-hmm. yeah. and, trauma. And, all, and trauma, because these are the things that you can stop and do. And if you do them, they do help a lot. Yeah. They really do. Well, I think about like, he makes me lie down. Well, mm-hmm. I think about the times I don't want to lie down and mm-hmm. then all of a sudden my body gives out and I have to, you know, it's the yeah. like, <laughs> he makes me lie. Yeah. And he, and he leads me beside quiet waters. And when I picture yeah. that and I'm usually in front of like green grass and I'm just, okay, Lord, you're making me do this. He's, and I love how he says it makes, he's making us do mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, he knows this is going to happen. So he's making us he's provided a way to yeah. order. So you say for 50 years, evangelicals and politics in America have been unhealthily entwined in a mutual pursuit of power, contrasting with Jesus' kingdom built in the hearts of the forgotten and the oppressed, urging us to reject unchristlike ways despite their acceptance as Christian. I can definitely say that feels very true right now in the culture. Can you expound on this? And do you think this loss of focus on the kingdom of God is increasing the amount of anxiety and depression in Christians? 
Yeah, <laughs> I mean, this could be its own like episode. <laughs> it could. Or three ah, it totally episodes. could. <laughs> when goodness. I was writing this, I was like. This is good. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't yeah. know how deep you want me to go into this because <laughs> the simple answer is yes. Yeah. So in a lot of my story, I really did deconstruct and really try and work out what I believe. And a lot of what I did was I studied church history. So I'm a huge church history nerd, and I'm very aware of the different movements that have popped up, even American church history and why they've popped up. So I could speak to some of that. What I'd like to springboard, like I said earlier, I love just pulling back to Jesus. So let me start there, and then we could go wherever conversation goes. And the very next question you guys have is around John 11, where, where he raises Lazarus from the dead. But right after that, he raised Lazarus from the dead, and you have the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish ruling council. They are the teachers of the law. So you have the Pharisees and mm -hmm. the Sadducees in there. And they're together, and they are they hear about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, and they're freaked out. And then they're like, they're scared to death. They're like, oh no, like people are beginning to believe in him, and, and more people are beginning to follow him. And they say, if we let it go on like this, the Romans will take away our religion and our nation. And so what we see, first of all, are the same fears that led to Jesus's crucifixion are the same fears that caused, not all, but I believe that have caused, and, and I could tie some of it back to the reason that drove the religious right, but they drove religious leaders within American Christianity to seek power in ways that are similar to the Sanhedrin with mm -hmm. Rome. Mm. Yeah. And so the same yeah. type of collusion that we saw lead Jesus to the cross has happened mm. here in America oh. with Christians and politics. Wow. And so that, if nothing else, that should cause us to like, you know, give us goosebumps and kind of stand in kind of fear of some potential anti-Jesus. I don't want to use the term antichrist. People have ideas of what that is, but anti-kingdom like ways. Mm -hmm. And James 3 says, I love it. He talks about two different types of wisdom, wisdom from a below that's demonic and wisdom from above, which is of God. And he says that the wisdom that is from below seeks after selfish ambition, seeks after pride. It's divisive. I mean, it just lists all these bullying. things. Yeah. 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 Bullying. And it's those same value systems that says is wisdom from below that we see. And it's, Man, I, I got to tell you that within kind of the trauma circles, you got to be really careful talking about kind of the spiritual world. I don't want to over-spiritualize things. But if we believe that there is kind of something at play in those worlds and that there is some demonic, non-Jesus-like principalities and rulers that have some rebellious authority that are at play here in our world, that's what we see has their claws and they don't favor a partisan side. Mm -hmm. They just care about power. Right. And yeah. so there's a lot there. I think that Christianity within America as a whole has kind of had some anxiety around it. You have the Puritans and the, I mean, like, they make Christmas illegal. Mm -hmm. They would, I mean, it was a, a straight up theocracy. And so as America became a melting pot, you have people like Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson wasn't a Christian, he was a deist. Mm -hmm. which meant he didn't believe in miracles. He believed that there was a God, but he had stepped back and doesn't involve right. himself right. in our world. So you have a deist, you have George Washington, who he was what we would call now an Episcopal. I think he was a senior warden, which meant that he led his board. So he was a Christian, but he had slaves. He was a slave owner of slaves that were Muslim, that had all kinds of different faiths. And so when they wrote our constitution and put, you know, our first amendment in place, it was actually to keep from a theocracy and to keep the peace with all these other beliefs that some of their slaves and other people around them had. And so we tend to have these anxieties around specifically the First Amendment, and we try and fight for them since. You fast forward, and there is trauma. Jonathan Edwards, there are four different pillars that have led American Christianity and evangelicalism to the place it is now. Hmm. You should write and a book on that. That'd be yeah. <laughs> There's multiple books. The best one, Randall Balmer wrote the book, The Making of Evangelicalism. And what I love mm -hmm. about him is he's a historian that doesn't really have a bias other than telling the truth. Where mm -hmm. some yeah, other I, ones I read, you hear like cynicism in it and you yeah. hear bias yeah. in it. His is not. 
But so you see kind of this through the revivals, you see how people process like Jonathan Edwards had 11 kids and lost some. And so some of his intensity of saying things like, you he's know, very angry, um, right? Yeah, he's very angry. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. He was like, you were like a spider being dangled over a fire that, and God looks at you with low eyes and all this stuff he's saying. Well, you read some of his other works and he's spiritual bypassing all over the place. Because yeah. he, he lost one of his kids and he just doesn't know how to handle yeah. uh, mm. the pain and the grief. And so there's a lot of the things that have led to where we're at now. But in the last 50 years, to go back to the last 50 years, what we see actually, I was raised in the movement under Bob Jones. Yeah. Bob Jones, yeah. him and Jerry Falwell, they wanted to keep their segregated schools. And so they were racist. And they wanted to keep their segregated schools. And so what they did was they honestly, they, and I would say that it's still, we are seeing the fruit of it now, manipulating good hearted, justice minded Christians that care about life to get on the train to only focus on kind of the abortion mm-hmm. issue in order to protect segregated schools. Mm-hmm. And I could tell you, and it, it's a power play. Yeah, And I could tell you, and you're like, well, how do you know that? And I said, well, because the circles I was in, Bob Jones University didn't even allow interracial dating until 2000. Mm -hmm. And so what you're seeing is you're seeing these religious leaders in America that are manipulating the good hearts of good, justice, righteous-minded Christians in America to seek power and to hold their own what I would say, evil rights and ways. And so that's a long way to say, this is where we're at now. (laughs) And so we now have to see through, because like I said, the powers of darkness, they don't favor a person and they don't favor a partisan side of the aisle. Yeah. So we enter into this and we hear things that are all just fear and it kicks up our anxiety that, you know, this election is going to be the election that makes or breaks all these things that we hear yeah. those things and they're playing off the anxieties of good hearted people. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. I agree. I'm so, so passionate true. about this, but it's a touchy topic because it is so divisive. <laughs> yes. In our world right now, but I 100% agree with what it's you're bringing saying. bringing up a lot of anxiety in people. Yeah. Yes. And anger. And, and, division, anger. And, mm-hmm. and the division. I mean, it's like your family members even, they're so passionate about it. And I'm so completely the opposite. Yeah. Because <laughs> I told yeah. you what you're saying and you feel like they don't see that side of it. And it, it's just sad to me that it's so divisive. Yeah. And like you said, they're, I think they're good intentioned. You know, yep. they think they are, they think they're, you know, but it's, it's just really sad. Yeah. And I never want to question people's intentions. It's just, I think it's hard, you know, and I never want to take a posture of like, well, I know this, I study this because there's so many opinions out there and stuff like that. My big deal, again, I go back, does it look like Jesus? Right. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Right. And what does it look like to find peace within Jesus who's actually on the throne? Like, we're not waiting for him to be on the throne. He ascended Mm -hmm. to the right hand of the Father and he rules now and he rules the nations now. And there's nothing that's done now, just like he allowed humans to come co-create and to join them in partnership in creation with them at the very beginning in Genesis 1 and 2 before the fall, he also invited the spiritual world to do the same. Mm -hmm. And so you have these inner plays here to where he's going to allow, because he's allowed for people to have authority and they've met a mess of it, he's going to allow it to a point until Mm -hmm. one day he does it. And so it's not like because we see this stuff happening in our world and our nation that he's not on the throne. Right. It just means that he has chosen to share his authority mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and he will judge, especially humanity on how that authority has been used. Mm. And, and it's upside down. I mean, can you imagine in people like Adolf Hitler outside of America, people like Adolf Hitler having to face and hear the stories of every bit of abuse and oppression and death that happened at their hands. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the ultimate reconciliation. Yeah. So anyway, I have a whole other theology of that concept of, but God's on the throne now. He's he's not step back. He's not. Yeah. Yeah. We need to trust that so that we're not filled with anxiety. That's for sure. Yes. 
So you say true freedom comes from shedding the burdens of past mistakes and hurts that we think define us, just as Jesus instructed. Take the grave clothes off and let him go, John eleven forty four. Do you think this is part of the reason people continue to have anxiety and depression? Are we just holding on to things and can't let go? <laughs> to be continued. Stay tuned for next week's part two. You don't want to miss it. Thanks for tuning in to Hanging on to Hope. Check out our website, hangingontohope.org. There are resources on there, and if you would like to donate or volunteer, you can do that through our website. We are a brand new nonprofit, so we appreciate any and all support. And we thank you for listening. And until next time, keep hanging on to hope. We are evidence that there is hope and healing for you, and our passion is to help you find it too. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening, everyone.